Hi guys. What's up? It's Melly and you all. Mm-hmm. Just like Mikey and Nikki. Mm-hmm. If, um Melly, if you had to assign um like us to like who is Mikey and who is Nikki, I you're Nikki. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you? You're okay. Mikey. Okay. And it's because sometimes I wake up in the morning and my eyes are offset. <laughs> it happens to me a lot. Ask uh, today. I just today I looked in the mirror and I had to go like this a little to my left eye. Wow, guys, Yoav has a lazy eye. <laughs> Maybe I really hope one day that I don't have a lazy eye. I don't sucks. think it. I don't think it just goes away. Well, I don't know, because it happens sometimes in the mornings when my eyes are little. All right, guys, we don't need to get up close and personal. <laughs> um, get up close and personal with Bob Dylan pin. Is that Robert Zimmerman? Yes. Anyways, uh, I, welcome back to One on One. Oh, That was one of the most annoying things I've done in a while. Not calling him Bob Dylan. Welcome back to One on One Ratio Pod. I've Welcome heard, back. Did you want to do the intro? Nope. Go I ahead. Episode twenty eight. Mikey and Nikki. Yes, from nineteen seventy seventy six. Something yeah, like that. Seventy six. Directed by Elaine May. We'll get to it. First, as usual, we're going to start a little with some news. Movie news. Let's go. There's news. a lot of Newsy. movie news. Newsy moves. <laughs> uh, news okay. of yeah, the there movie. Is a lot. Shall we? Shall we start? Yeah, I'm going to start. Okay. I'm taking the. Go I'm ahead. taking the. Taking the lead on this one. Classic, classic Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we're starting off really strong. Okay. We got the first look at Christian Bale as Frankenstein's monster in Jake in sorry in Maggie Gyllenhaal's The Bride. We also got a first look Ooh, at I Jesse Buckley. That. Here is Let me pull that up. Here okay. is Christian oh, I did Bale. See this. Yes, I did see this. And okay. here is Jesse Buckley. Okay. Yeah. Cute. Um, I'm excited to see what this movie's gonna give us. I love a good Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it looks it looks cute. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It doesn't look like something special. We got to wait for it's, the trailer. Yeah, we got to wait for the trailer. But, you know, that's very traditional Frankenstein makeup. Mm-hmm. You know, Maggie. Or... Jesse Buckley. Yeah. Jesse Buckley is... um A little unconventional. Yeah. A little unconventional. Hmm? It's giving Hunger Games. Pan M. Effie Trinket. Effie Trinket played by the aunt of that one girl from that one guy from our school. Yes, yes. <laughs> what was his name again? Guys, Elizabeth Banks, Wait, who directed what was his Cocaine name? Bear and also played Effie Trinket, has a how do you say nephew? Yeah. Who was at who was my age. His name was Jack. I won't say. I should probably not say his name. Don't say his last name. <laughs> Jack. And I was friends with him. Nepotism baby right there. Nepo baby. And he doesn't Ooh. come to my club. How rude. Well, he's also like... Okay, well, I won't say so. I'll Whatever. Next we'll piece smack. of news. We'll Next talk smack of off camera. <laughs> Olivia Coleman and Benedict Cumberbatch are ready to duke it out in satirical divorce comedy, The Roses, written by Poor Thing screenwriter Tony McNamara. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And that's an accomplished screenwriter right there who is very idiosyncratic. So um, I am very looking forward to this film, and I really want to see Olivia Coleman and Benedict Cumberbatch duke it out. Hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. So we'll we'll track the process of that production. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Keep, keep an eye on. Uh next up. Um we got the first trailer for Maxine. 
I did write that down, yes. Um, I saw that, and you know what? It's I think the Max trailer scene. Yeah. Max. I thought the trailer was a little too long and gave away a little mediocre. too much. It was mediocre. Yeah, but I am still gonna watch it. So we'll see how go. that goes. I promised I promised my friend would go. Um it just like it looks like a there's like a murderer. Mm-hmm. That's not her. No. Because she's not killing. It's like this stra- strangler. I don't know. I dude. don't know. I don't. I don't know how much I like the visual tone of it either. We'll see. Well, I'm. I'm also a hater. That's true. You love is a hater. X and Pearl fan. So, so okay. We'll see what happens with Maxine. What do you guys think? Tell us in the comments. Denis Villeneuve is in talks to direct an adaptation of Annie Jacobson's book, Nuclear War, a scenario for legendary the production company. Oh. Um. Th- so this is a very acclaimed book that's come out recently and been talked a lot in in novel. It's it's a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Oh, wow. Um. The filmmaker is in discussion to reunite with legendary for an adaptation of um nuclear war, and. Legendary also confirmed that it is also working with Villeneuve to develop the third Dune film. Yes. So we found out that Dune Messiah is in fact in development yes. right now with Legendary, but also that he's working on this other side project that's about nuclear war. And wow. apparently the war the novel is devastating and about actually like a scenario where where nuclear war starts and I don't know if I have the heart for that at this point after a year of Oppenheimer's and and Zone of Interest and stuff. So we'll see what happens with that in the coming few years. And we'll see if it gets if developed. Not a nuclear war, an actual nuclear war. Let's um, hope. Let's not manifest that, shall we? We won't manifest it, but guys, <laughs> let's just say it's not as far as we think. Oh. Okay. How much did that cost you? Too much. Too much money. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> we at need the, too much. At the local Cinemark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that, that shit is so expensive. I once went to, I think it was the second Guardians of the Galaxy movie in like 20. Mm-hmm. When was that? 20. I went with my mom and I was like, Mom, that popcorn bucket is so fucking sick. I want to get the popcorn bucket. And then we looked at the price and it was like $40. I mean, this wasn't for 40 the popcorn but... bucket. Yeah. For the Guardians of the Galaxy 2 box, that's one, that's $20 for each Guardian of the Galaxy. Yeah. Because there's two in this. Anyways, let's. This little guy is so funny. All right, next piece of news. <laughs> All right. Rafe finds Charlie Hunnan, Jody Whoa. Comer are all Comer. in talks. Comer? Yeah. Sorry. Who is Charlie Hunnan. Charlie Hunnam? Hun- I don't know, whatever. I'll show you a picture of him. I'll find. Are all. Okay are all in talks to star okay. in Danny Boyle's 28 years later starring Killian Murphy. Mm-hmm. The third movie in the... I in, had... In this installment. Heard about this. Wait, the third movie? Yes. What's the second movie? Uh, 28 weeks later. I didn't know there was 28 weeks. Well, if you guys, I mean, I don't want to spoil a different episode, but if you guys remember our horror ranking, which we did, I think it was a few months back. Yeah, October. Melly put 28 Days Later at the number numero uno, which was a big deal at the time, caused a lot of controversy amongst the one-on-one ratio pod fandom. Um, what can I say? So, I like to be unconventional. So, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so yeah, 
So now, we, what do you think of 28 weeks later? So, I haven't seen it. Charlie Hunnam has the most, like, masculine, like... Filmography? Buster Frill filmography. The King yeah. Arthur, Legend of the Sword, The Gentleman with Matthew McConaughey, yeah. Rebel Moon by Zack Snyder, Pacific Rim movies, The Lost... I remember really wanting to see The Lost City of Z in 2016. Isn't that with Brad Pitt? No, that's him. He's the lead. Oh. I guess, oh, Brad Pitt's in World War Z. Yeah, fun fact about Lost City of Z. I, when, when I found the movie Z by Costal Gavas, which is one of my favorite movies ever nowadays, mm-hmm. um, I thought it was the Lost City of Z when I put it on. Oh, you're funny. <laughs> and then I was like, I fuck with this. <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola is already working on it. I wrote, I wrote Worming, a little dune cheekier. It's already working on his next film after yep. Megalopolis. Yeah. So yep. <laughs> that's <laughs> the guy is like back on a roll. Mm-hmm. Um, but Megalopolis um was revealed to be screening at um con this year. So hey, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can can can. Can, 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 can. There we go. Chan, chan. Chan. Ch- it's pronounced Chan? Yes, it's Chan. Chan, <laughs> chan Film Festival, duh. <laughs> um, we'll be screening it at Can this year. Um, So we will get it in theaters probably after that. If you, what? If you, maybe Oscar season, maybe December, maybe December. Hopefully. We'll see. Uh, so there is a final cut of the film. It was at it was pre-screened somewhere. Those 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 photos of Francis Ford outside of the pre-screening. Um, thought they were very funny. I don't know if you saw that he posted on his Instagram. Yep. And looking forward to Megalopolis, probably my most anticipated of the year. Yeah, honestly, I think mine too. And no, there, those first Megalopolis looks, and uh, Challengers. Mm-hmm. Challengers is definitely up there as well. And Nosferatu. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, Anya Taylor Joy, Tilda Swinton, and Julianne Moore will star in Pedro Almodovar's first English language movie, The Room Next Door. The movie also stars Dua Lipa. His feature, his first feature. English language feature. Yeah, because he made Strange Way of Life. Sorry, you're right, you're right. Feature. I'm sorry. <laughs> the room. You know why? It's I just forget that that exists because it's so bad. Yeah, we don't talk about Strange Way of Life starring Ethan Hawke and Pedro Pascal. Yeah. Anyways, we um, talk about it. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Pedro Almodovar for me is very hit or miss. So. Mm-hmm. You did like Woman on the Verge. Yes. You were, you were interested at least in Volver. No, no, I like Volver, I think, more than Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. Pedro Monavar, I love him. I love his features. I haven't seen a lot of his shorts. Parallel Mothers was his last feature. Yeah. And that was um amazing. And one of the best melodramas from the last few years. So mm-hmm. um Parallel Mothers is how I imagine May December is. Like Kind of melodrama on like the melodrama front. Meh. We'll see. Um, check out Parallel Mothers, Money. You should, you I will. should really check that out. There's also a bunch of other Omodovar movies you should get to. Because he even if he is hit and miss, when he hits, it's it hits. Yeah. Yeah. And his movies are very fun to look at anyways. Very Speaking true. Of fun filmmakers. Well, this this filmmaker is very important to me. He's one of the filmmakers that are studied in school. Um, David Lynch. Oh, <laughs> don't tell me funding. we have the same piece of news. Oh shit. Go. David Lynch is looking for funding his animated fairy tale project, Snoop World, which was rejected by Netflix. Fuck. I'm sorry. 
if there are any billionaires out there reading this, <laughs> oh, I copied this from an Instagram post. If there are any billionaires out there reading this who like art, please just give this man the backing to make this happen. Like, guys, I'm let's so... make Snoop World happen. How can you say no to the man that made the hit shows... sensation TV show Twin Peaks? It just shows. It just shows that Netflix has no appreciation for uh, oh, cinema as an art form or obviously. television as an art form because they don't care about that because they care about numbers and content and screen time and David Lynch's movies are very slow. So Snoot World animated film, try getting it. Go go to A24, David. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. Someone device. said that he should go to Apple. They would love yeah, Apple would Apple would also like something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, go to I... Apple, go to A twenty four. You're fucking David Lynch. Like, I can't believe we're in a um place in the industry right now where David Lynch can't get funding, and that happened with Even... Scorsese a few years back. For and Trevor's... Francis Ford Coppola. And Francis Ford Coppola. Francis Ford, Mister, I directed the Godfather. Coppola can't get Guys, funding. David Lynch. Do I need to remind you who he is, guys? Clearly you do. I guys. I saw a comment on Twitter or People. someone tweeted um they said in in all caps I'll sell myself so David can make this film. Dude, I'll sell I myself too. Like spe- like sent all the money I have for Snoop World to happen. What, what is this bullshit, guys? It's He studied in film schools. Like, he's mm-hmm. considered one of the best directors of our time. And he hasn't made a feature since Inland Empire. And it's so nice to see that he's working on something. And you're rejecting him, Netflix. The only thing he made with you, Netflix, is um that monkey short film. That was very funny. And is very is kind of like a cult classic among his fans and his filmography now. So why can't you trust him and give him a little bat? Well, actually, fuck Netflix, David. Go, don't go to Netflix. Netflix go sucks anyways. Any, dude, I feel like any like artsy studio would be clambering to get to get your film. Neon, like, someone get neon, neon on this. Twenty four, just like go to those and they will be like, wow, because those are studios that appreciate art. Yeah. Like, if I if I had a production company and David Lynch like came to me, dude. <laughs> I mean, I Anyways. would I would shit my pants, but um. I would shit my pants as well. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna say one more piece of news and I'm gonna wrap it up because I have too much. Okay. Um, last piece of news that actually came out today, guys. Today. The first trailer for Joker. I has... that was my last piece. Okay. Well. Let's talk about I it. I watched it. Did you watch it? I did. I think it looked it. really good. I was excited. Me too. Me <laughs> I'm too. not going to lie. Guys, I'm a hater. I hate Joker 1. <laughs> I'll, and I and I kind of love it at the same time. Okay. Why do you? That is a very entertaining work right there. Mm-hmm. Um it's not what it thinks it is. No. But it's very entertaining and it is very dark and it is very sad and it manages to get that taxi driver king of comedy vibe and translate it to modern, you know, filmmaking ways. I probably I haven't seen King of Comedy or Taxi Driver. Oh. So sorry about that guys. And I will get to those movies. They're just big like lulls in my Scorsese watching experience. However, I th- and I think that I would like them better than Joker 1. I thought Joker 1 was really cool when I watched it. And it was very, like, it was, like, a very adult movie that I watched when it came out. And I was like, oh, I'm watching an adult adult movie when I watched it. And now it's, like, cool. It's, I, like, really liked. And, like, looking back, like, I'm, I've been a hater because he's, like, a, a Todd Phillips. I don't like him. As yeah. And, like interviews and stuff and you know there's a lot of hate for joker and the joker hate is rising folly ado looks good it looks really the good photography is crisp right right the acting looks cool mm-hmm. the editing of the trailer was great 
the editing was it it didn't give like much away. The tone seems interesting with the like kind of like classic musical vibes. I'm so excited, Lady Gaga. All oh. I'm asking, all I'm asking is that they don't go back to the staircase and do a musical number there, because they might. I want this to be like independent from the first movie. They might though. That's. That's just my thing, is that I don't want them to do that. But, I, let's not, can we not lie to ourselves for a second? Twitter and Letterboxd, can we not lie to ourselves for a second? Um, Folly Do looks kind of entertaining and cool. So let's stop being pretentious. Just for a minute, just for this one. Let's yeah. stop being, like, take down the printage, pretentious city. Of mm-hmm. And I'm the most pretentious person you'll meet. You know That's me. very true. It's just... It's just folly of do looks really fun. And mm-hmm. you know folly of fun. Folly of fun. <laughs> so let's get let's just go. Let's go. Let's just have it. fun. Let's oh. just have fun. Um, I'm excited. I might if it doesn't get good reviews, I probably won't go. I'm not gonna lie. I will. I'll support my queen gaga. Uh, if she doesn't shing shing oh my god. Shing? <laughs> Shing. <laughs> she doesn't sing. Melly got me up at seven in the morning. Sorry, if she doesn't sing, no. Karma is a bitch. Whatever the exactly. fuck. Yeah. If she doesn't sing, Car- the JoJo C si- a cover of the JoJo Siwa si- song Karma, I will not be a going. I was gonna say if she doesn't sing Sha La 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 Lo with Joaquin Phoenix instead of Bradley. Oh. Then I'm not gonna be seated. I hope she sings that. Yeah, and then the Joker does this like raspy in the sha la 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 lo. All right, and then enough with you. Her. He's like, he's like, I'm the Joker. Guys, I have a superpower. <laughs> what? I'm not gonna reveal it right now, but I'll reveal it later. Okay, shall we move on? Let's do our <laughs> thing. We start talking about Mikey and Nikki. <laughs> no, we gotta do our film so oh. we watch. Sorry, I'm I'm too hasty. Um, Hold would on. you like to start? I'll I... start, and I'm gonna do a speed round because we got no time okay. left in the Zoom. So I'm gonna go quick, 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 quick. Okay. First up, I watched right. another round directed by Thomas, um, Vinterberg. Vinterberg. What did you um, think of that one? It was it was it was good. I had a fun time. Um, I was so fun. I was dancing up in the airplane. Um, lots of fun there. La- <laughs> Mads Mikkelsen was great. My review on Letterboxd is where you'll get the full scoop of things. That's where I said what I had to say. Um, yes. Next up, I watched The Hangover. What a life! What a life! What a beautiful, beautiful yes. life! But what's not a beautiful life was The Hangover. Woo! Coincidentally, I is directed by Todd Phillips. Um, I did not like The Hangover. I thought it was a shitty movie, and I don't think it deserves the um the hype. It gets misogynistic as fuck. Yep, um, not funny. Uh, don't give a fuck. Don't care. Don't care. Don't care. Don't care. I'm not gonna lie. There was the one joke that made me laugh in that movie mm-hmm. was one where Zach Galifianakis says the R slur, and I'm sorry. It's very. It's very funny. It. It's very funny. I don't and remember where that happens. It. They're in the car and he just Oh, it. oh, it's yeah, funny. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. That's okay. really funny. That the way he delivers that joke is really fucking funny. Um My bad. But yeah, I've <laughs> seen it now. Don't need to watch it ever again. Next up, no. um, I watched Bruno, directed by Oh my god, fucking I don't Is know. that the one with Sasha? With Sasha yes. going. Oh <laughs> my god. God, that movie was fucking crazy. My friends and I watched it. Um, mm-hmm. I have no words. I'm not going to say anything about the movie. Bora except... or Bruno? Bruno's crazier. What? Bruno is crazier by a You're lot. You're telling me there's a crazier movie than Bora? Yes. What? Everything that <laughs> happens in the movie is real. Um same with Bora. I know, but like this is crazier. All I'm gonna say is that that last scene. Let's just say they get a bunch of rednecks. Oh my god, I don't. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Anyways, I watched Bruno Dude. with my friends. It's really fun to watch with friends because you guys are all. Does it get more intense than like that naked fight in oh, the climax oh, of Oh yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, and then the last thing I watched was um Funny Games. I rewatched Funny Games. Yeah, that's it. Original or remake? Original. Thoughts? Love it. Want to rewatch? Great. Amazing. Um, Yo, your I watched turn. Free Solo for film class from 2018. Oh, got a lot of hype. It wasn't that good. Made I've seen that. Next, um, <laughs> I watched a uh the accident and portrait of my family in my 13th year, which was a beautiful uh set of two short films that I very very recommend. I love when movies when filmmakers make movies about it, like half documentaries, recreational shit. I love it. You know, my but my love for Karastami, who we'll get to in a second. The Holy Mountain is considered one of the best surreal films of all time. Um, Just look at the poster. Just I can't believe you watched film. Holy Mountain and you didn't tell me. I watched it with Zev Rodnitsky on Zoom. Um, It was good, but I wouldn't recommend it to you, Melody. Well, I w- it was it's it was in my watch list before it was in your it's watch satanic list. Satanic and surreal. I like that. And awesome, but it's very pretentious. It's very. It's like even for me. Mm. There's some parts where it's like where the director is talking, and it's like, dude, you're like, shut in up. your own movie doing this right now. I think there are some wonderful, amazing parts, and I took down a star because it, there's just some stuff where it's like, but I do like the thing of it being like a spiritual journey and like kumbaya, kumbaya, you know? Yeah. Like that. It's very violent. There's a scene where someone gets his balls chopped off, and <laughs> well, let me tell you. <laughs> Damn. Let me tell you. Oh, uh, no, there's some crazy shit in that movie happens. Very grotesque, very violent very sexually violent very everything violent but it's also really beautiful so which is our excuse for watching that kind of stuff it's art um <laughs> anyways then i watched mikey and nikki and then right after mikey and nikki i went to see taste of cherry directed by Kirastami from 97 in theaters um maybe one of the most beautiful movies ever made really transcendent really beautiful very simple very wonderful very everything you know he's like my favorite director so taste of cherry hell yeah guys right in theaters shall we move to the next segment yeah sorry for rushing but we have no time on this zoom so we gotta (laughs) buck it over to the next one but um oh no oh oh, no Yoav, can you can you raise your hand for me? Oh oh, oh. I got oh, you wait, sucker! No, no, that is oh oh I got you sucker! Oh look at my name! Raise your hand if you're part of the shitty friend club. Oh oh, oh god! I I thought that meant that I have a shitty friend. No, it it means you are the shitty friend. No, you're the shitty friend is what I'm getting. Okay, you know I have a stomach problem. Can you not air that out to the public, please? Like, Jesus. Um, He's so insensitive. You're the Nikki to my Mikey. You're the Nikki to my Mikey. And you're the reason why um, I feel the way I do about life. Oh, 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 really, really? In a bad way. Okay, okay, well. You're well... like the American New Wave, and I'm like the... Um, the Italian neorealism. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna. You're the American. You're the American new wave, and I'm the French new wave because I influenced you. Oh, shut up! Because, oh, oh, you're funny, even though I'm older than you. Okay, so. <laughs> bookie, 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 so... Bookie. But, oh. Does Zeb do that to you or no? All that. No, he does okay. that too. I guess that's something um, we do because you know he's not part of the shitty friend society. <laughs> I'm kidding. Francis. He's the fucking president of shitty friend society. <laughs> that guy is the flakiest guy you'll ever meet. Welcome. <laughs> not as flaky as our... another guy. 
I'll name drop him later. His name starts with an S and ends with. Oh yes. Yeah. Well, you got... <laughs> well yes, I was talking about him. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. From that, guys, the <laughs> amount of shit that's being thrown in this podcast. Um, 1976, directed by Elaine May, who is Mike Nichols' wife. Yep. Love she you, helped. Mike. Love you, Elaine. Love it. Don't expect to like him. In Philadelphia, a small-time bookie who stole mob money is in hiding, and he begs a childhood friend to help them evade the hitman who's on his trail. That's a bad synopsis, because that makes it seem like a normal crime movie, and it's yeah, really it does. not, because it's, not. it's really fucking sad, and I want to cry. So, the original reel of this film was a thousand, um, yep, sorry, yep. one million feet long a million feet four baby four hours one four hours long around um and they cut it down because there's a lot of improvisation it stars peter falk and john cassavetes and you see elaine may behind me who is such a present person in this whole thing like you could really feel her directorial view on this she's she's excellent she's an excellent writer the screenplay is amazing in my opinion um, the editing really did a good job in compressing and taking the most emotional beats out of it. Direct, uh, edited by John Carter, the same guy that did Taking Off. Mm-hmm. The producer of this also did Taking Off. There's a lot of... It, it's the same kind of crew of people that were in the American New Wave and Taking Off is part of that, technically, even though it's a Czechoslovakian director. Um, so this is, you know... This is like the the regular crew from the American New Wave, yeah, kind of deal, deal. Um, the the makeup artist that did this, did the makeup for this, did it for Taxi Driver, Midnight Cowboy, The French Connection, Clute. Again, more that makes a lot of sense. But I just wanted to throw that out there because that's cool. Yeah, that's a cool filmography out there. Um, so let's talk about it. Let's can I, about- can I just start by saying that I thought this was amazing? Yeah, no, I don't know if we're obviously. On the same page. I loved it. Um, I knew you were gonna really I, like this. this I was loved like, it. Your alley. This is very up my alley. I love the American New Wave. Um, and I am just such a big fan of the grimy, grainy, um audio replacement like bad like clunky sound editing like grimy dirty 70s like emotional filmmaking like this isn't this is functioning on like completely different um like it's interested in completely different things than you'd see in any other like conventional like movie it's interested in the emotion and and the reality and the rawness of of the characters and really feeling them and it is so it is so beautiful it's so beautiful it's so heartbreaking it's so complicated emotionally and it's so existential and raw and yeah um i just loved the the feeling like i said that 70s like real like grotesqueness um and i also love the feeling behind this Mm -hmm. so i thought this was um just wonderful so that's my first little thing i i definitely how were you feeling um like as i don't particularly love taxi driver as a movie but um i will say obviously like the aesthetics of it is drop dead gorgeous and yeah this definitely reminded me of that like but more um dirty version of it i guess dirty. not as flashy I feel like taxi and bright. drivers yeah more calculated as mm-hmm. well more precise um if you've seen the works of john cassavetes who's the star of this which um, oh my god his works as a direct okay we'll get there we'll get there smash your past john cassavetes right now um so hard of a smash <laughs> wow <laughs> wow um... <laughs> sorry had he, to you know who he there. looks like um, when i was watching the movie yes. i was like he looks like anthony bourdain 
He kind of does. He, he does. looks and like he could be Melly's like, the biggest Anthony Bourdain fan. I love Anthony Bourdain. Rest in peace, my um, king. He's great. His directorial works are also very, very celebrated and mm-hmm. analyzed and big pieces of film history. Obviously, you've got Opening Night, Woman Under the Influence, um, Killing of a Chinese Bookie, Faces, Shadows, all of those films. So incredible. And it's the same kind of vibe as this movie. They're very clunky, emotionally mm-hmm. driven, depressing, conversational films. And Mikey and Nikki pose this off in a different way than how Class of Eddie directs his films, but it's very similar in the improvisational um, nature of it and the clunkiness. And I always... I'm just such a sucker for it. I just eat that shit up. I'm such a sucker for it. I always say that the best directors are also the ones that know how to act. It's true. I always say that because, like, how can you... You can't... <laughs> I mean... I feel like in order to really achieve the status of such a great director, like you also have yeah. to know how working in front of a like a camera works and stuff like that. Well, Elaine May is like a comedian of sorts. She was a very she had like a comedian. Like she's known for her directorial things, but she was also just a comedian. Mm-hmm. So she was an act all comedians are actors in their own right. Of course. Um, and she was also obviously friends with Falk and Cassavetes. Uh, the way she works with these actors well, is brilliant. I mean, that's why. Um, and this is a very modern, obviously, but that's why Bill Hader is such a phenomenal director. Yeah. I don't know. You I haven't seen Barry. That. I've seen a little bit of it. I've oh, you seen have a little bit of the first season. I thought it was great. I just didn't continue. I thought it was very okay. Lynchian. How are we still friends? How are we still friends? I feel like, you know how Mikey and Nikki takes place over one night and then they're not friends at the end? Mm-hmm. That's me and you. This tonight is the last, is our, like, before I kill, like, I like I close the door on you and then you die. Okay, what the fuck? <laughs> okay, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's um, that's so sweet of you. I love John Cassavetes. I, I love everyone's pinky rings in this movie. I want a pinky ring. Do you now? What you want to be that? a fucking okay? All right. I love. I love. I'm sorry. I love. <laughs> I love pinky rings now. I think they're really cool. All right. Not that these are characters that I um look up to. In any way, they they are, you know, you get Mikey and Nikki, which, which are kind of low level gangsters, you know, working under the, like basically this guy. They, they're they the same guy's bitch um, working no. for him. Cassavetti stole from him and Mikey is still um, working with him and doing things for him. Although he finds out later that he doesn't really like him. Um, of course but, not. There are things to appreciate about these characters. Mikey is willing to go to great lengths for his friend who's dying. Um, or maybe dying. He has some kind of stomach ulcer situation. <laughs> um, and this opening sequence, Nikki comes in. and Well, Nikki calls Mikey. Mm-hmm. And he comes in. And Mikey is just the most loyal, kind friend to Nikki. And you know you can see their funny kind of banter and their and their sassiness to one another but really from the opening scene you just tell it it just feels like these characters have been friends for so long yeah like yeah their performances for sure are so like i can just tell that they've been friends since a, since childhood and you can see their relationship and you can see how much they kind of appreciate each other and specifically Mikey Mm-hmm. how much he's willing to do for Nikki and yeah he beats up this worker and the cafe worker for cream and all why that. was that kind of and hilarious that was very fun it is it listen there <laughs> are some comedic things to this I was film. dying it's I was dark, dying it's darkly comic yeah um I didn't laugh that much though because the thing is also with like Cassavetti's work as well you don't know when you can laugh and when it's like not funny at all there were a lot of very because unfunny it's very moments. Tonally, it's very <laughs> for sure. 
it's very tonally like real it's very like real life like there's not a lot of um com- like jokes there's mm-hmm. no jokes in this movie I, I i can't say there's a joke in this movie, no no but there are like funny human situations that actually there is a joke in this movie whenever he in whenever they're like sitting at that like barish kind of place and he's like he was like i'll tell your mother and then he does that tongue oh part. yeah 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 i i, I did i did right he blows raspberry I, I I chuckled a little at that. That was funny as well. Um, Nikki is kind of a comedic performance in a way in the beginning of the film, I he, guess. The, his character he, seems like it ha- like he has like BPD. Yeah, he's very crazy. He's very all over the place. He's very um, neurotic and, and scared. And, you know, he's being he knows he's being hunted. Um, and Mikey's doing all the things him that he can and well so we let's see let's talk scenes. about it okay i mean it's very like like <laughs> he he sold him out mikey sold nikki out yeah what do you mean like remember when mikey was on the phone with that guy he was on the phone he was on the yeah. phone with the with the with the with no, the... he's on the phone with his wife. When was he on the phone with the guy? He sold Nikki out later in the movie after their big argument. Oh, am I okay? Wait, he was in the bar. Yeah, he was he... calling his wife. Are we sure? Yeah, because he was telling them they're going to the movie theater, and then the guy calls his wife, and that's how he knows that they're going to the movie theater. Okay, never mind then. I misunderstood. He, I think he sells the, the point where he sells them out is when he goes into the killer's car, um, and helps him hunt down Nikki. I thought it was Which before that. No, because they're still friends. They're childhood friends. It's like a big. This no. movie at the end of the day is about just a death. You know this. It's it's about the death of a friendship. I well it's, yes obviously yes this these childhood friends and and the night that ends their friendship yes where um Nikki's being hunted down this neurotic kind of funny guy and you, you can see why one would be a friend with Nikki you know he's yeah. such a fun person he's crazy and all that we all have that kind of friend in our life you know Sometimes I feel like that friend in other people's life. You know, we all do. Mm-hmm. It's 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 kind of this this kind of type of person that's a, usually a very popular person um that is neurotic that is, you know, you're attracted to the more existential um morbid aspects of his personality. He's a very nihilistic person, so it's like, oh, this person doesn't give a fuck, so I'll be his friend. And I can see why someone like Mikey would be a friend with him, and I could see how I could be a friend with him and why we would try to find we would have people like this. Um, yeah, and then Mikey have... grounds Nikki, so that's how like like their yeah. friendship dynamic makes sense. I I've had Friends like that as well, from my childhood, where um, I feel like at times I was the person grounding the relationship. I mm-hmm. feel like I was the, the person that was put, taking, well, not taking them down, but like letting, you know, inserting logic a little to their to their decisions. I, yeah. I felt like that person a lot, actually, throughout my life. So I, I do see, I do see that. I do see that, how that. Um, how someone would be friends with Nikki and how someone would be friends with Mikey as well. You know, they are criminals, but you know, from from just crime movies in general, like we excuse people's criminality so much because we start liking these people. Mm-hmm. That's just well, the power of crime movies. Well, except for well, no, no, later, I agree. It's I a agree. little hard. To, I agree it's with a little the... hard to love them. You're not gonna like them as the I, tagline of the film. I, says. I didn't necessarily love their character. Like obviously, like phenomenal well, yeah, actors, yeah. but yeah. no, like yeah. Even from no, the beginning, sure. like you can tell that they're these are really they, sketchy yes. guys. They are sketchy guys. Um I think the 
part that certified it for me you know it, the thing that they're involved in the crime is like sketchy it's sketchy yeah. i don't like people that are involved in crimes i would never be friends with these people but you know what i'm saying in my context if they weren't criminals or whatever the thing that solidified i guess we'll get to it but the thing that really solidified their awfulness was definitely that scene with the blonde woman um which we'll we'll get to it because that's a very that's yeah that's a very so the the compositions here and the framing are so raw and and intimate and uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and the dialogue are so improvised and spunky and fast-paced and sad and there's something special about this improvised dialogue where it doesn't sound improvised to me at least it doesn't sound improvised it just happens so when you're so natural so when your actors are so good and you've been rolling and filming for an hours for hours of long one shots you're gonna get to a point after like 30 45 minutes where the actor dissolves into the character and they become raw and the, mm-hmm. the scene becomes real and elaine may is constantly searching for this emotion this 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 hum this humanity that you find and i think it's the power of improvisation really is is um i mean let's talk about films like mike lay's secrets and lies like when you get to this human emotional part and and when the actors start divulging into the deepest depth of the souls of their characters that's when you get this real like humanity and this rawness to it that you can't even find in scripted cinema you can't now there is a script to this there is a basic outline to their conversations i'm sure but she would keep rolling for hours on end and you get to this rawness and this type of dialogue what were you thinking about the improv and the performances like and and how they I didn't even know that most of it or a lot of it was improv yeah until after um yes and I think that just kind of comes with the power of improv and being able to improvise um and I've always talked about how like being able to improvise is like a really um powerful tool that actors and non-actors alike can utilize in all settings of life um yeah but when you i think what you were saying like when you're able to really improvise and you're going hours on end and you are able to bring out um these sides of the characters that like as you said a script can't capture um it just kind of brings everything more to life. And I think that's what's so special. That's a, that's a good word for it. The side of the characters that the script can't, that a script can't get to. Yeah. Like, you're getting to this different, it's a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. I think it's amazing. It's fascinating to watch always. Um, and you can tell that, sorry, I was just going to say that, like, oh, you can tell that, like, these two like really like work well together oh yeah oh my they god were, they were They're... friends in real life they were all friends yeah but imagine i don't know how a real friendship could go could goes after this kind of friendship after you portray this kind of friendship and are in the characters for so long the amount of times cinematographic like rules are broken like the 180 rule like everything is is broken is isn't tremendous the movie is solely focused in its story and tone and less you know obviously the composition and the framing are beautiful can I, but um can i say something yeah why does the 180 rule exist it's it exists because like I, when for continuity, you're to film a conventional film, yeah. When you're trying okay. to film a con, not continuity, just for comfortability of the viewers. Gotcha. Because I get how in certain movies it works, but like I don't yeah. know why it's a big deal to go against it. Like in 
two different film classes I've taken, the teacher has talked about like the 180 degree rule and how like breaking yeah. it is like such a big deal. I'm like, mm, why can't we just do whatever the fuck we want? Like, just do I think whatever they you just want. want to emphasize specifically in film school that it's important to get to know those rules and get to know them very very well and yeah. under and work under certain boundaries like the 180 degree rule until you've mastered it and that's when you you know to learn how to break it is the hard part mm. because it's you you need to it's what um i don't remember who said this but there's that quote that's like you have to like master something in cinema before you can break the rule that's, like, that's you have it. to learn how to make conventional things and be pleasant to the audience before you know how to um break rules such as jump cuts or 180 degree rule yeah you know and elaine may um throws that out of the window here and makes purely emotional filmmaking that is solely focused in the story and the tone and the and the characters and she doesn't really account for all those things it's i think it's wonderful it's it's a different sort of filmmaking as we said earlier mm -hmm. nikki wants to say goodbye to his wife He's recently separated from and their kid and he and they're sitting in the bar and he smokes rings out of out of his cigarette and, and they pass. very sexy. And the and the smoke passes through and he's looking at Mickey. Um and they and they're kind of walking around, they're goofy goofing off. It's the beginning of the movie. I love how the whole movie is set in one night. I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. I thought that was cool. Um I don't want to go meet a girl tonight. I want to go to a movie. Literally me, core. <laughs> um, they're just going out. They're be best buds. Um, and you know there is a tension between them because mm -hmm. he's, you know, Nikki's always like, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna fucking die anyways. They're gonna kill me or I'm gonna die from my stomach ulcer. So Mikey is like, you know, trying to keep him occupied and then they're they're walking around i love the color scheme of the film i think it's very i love those browns those blues um and it just feels incredibly lived in everything here and so naturalistic and like engaging and specific and smart and then they go to this bar and Nikki does something racist <laughs> and then they leave the bar and, and they because make because Mikey gets him out of there before he's beat up. What difference does it make if all those people in the, that room beat me up? It wouldn't hurt as much as dying. This mm -hmm. guy's terrified of death. It's, it's a very existential, terrifying feeling that he's feeling. And then they hop on a bus. And again, it's like this constant movement, this constant evolution of the characters and their physical geographical movement around the city. They hop on the bus. There's that thing we mentioned earlier where he like blows raspberry to an old woman on the bus that tells him to stop smoking. Um, <laughs> it's my new favorite thing. That's what I wrote. Um, but Mikey does help Nikki stay out of trouble. Yeah, um, for sure. By, like, th there's that part where uh, you know, he he could get he's getting it like into this fight with the bus driver, and Mikey's like, "Come on, Nikki, like, come on, let's go, let's get out of here, let's get out of here," and um pushes his back, and then and then he helps him, he has his back when when Nikki ends up like carrying out these fights, he helps him beat up the bus driver and all that, but and they run away in glee and all that, but you know, it's it is a toxic friendship, you can tell. What were you thinking of of them as like friends? Um, like how was... like their toxicity or their or are they good for each other? Are no, they... they're not good for each other. I think it's kind of like one of those friendships where like once upon a time they were really close friends and um did everything together and once upon a time they really probably clicked when they like when they were younger you know but um yeah. as they grew up it it kind of was the type of friendship where it was more of a chore to not be friends than be friends if that makes sense yeah so like especially because for... they they're in the same field of work and mikey brought mm -hmm. him into 
Nikki. He brought Nikki into this guy. Yeah. And they're like in the working in the same crime circle. Yeah. So for convenience, you know, they stay friends. Um, because like I said, it's harder to not be friends than to actually just like, you know, be these yep. Fake, but I don't want to say fake, but you know, friends at this point. But um, there, I, I do think there is a very emotional bond between them, anyways. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying there isn't. Like, they're very that's why I'm saying that it's harder to not be friends than to be friends mm-hmm. because they will always have a very deep connection and they will always have um some sort of bond, you know? Um, yeah. Something that keeps them like yeah. tethered to each other, but you know, as they say, it, you're not destined to stay friends with everyone your entire life. Yeah, and um, even the people that like you are so closely attached to. Yeah. Um, that you have such strong emotional ties with. So. I think what makes this so emotional is is the fact that you can tell that their friendship is on the last straw mm-hmm. and they're clinging and you know all their friendshipness is kind of gone like you can kind of see their like goofing off and all that <laughs> you kind of see their they're goofing off and all that but you can also see that they're clinging on to the most emotional like bond the the, the, the last like all the all the you know the gig is up with their friendship they can goof off for a little, but the, the what's left is its emotional core. Well, when they goof off, we, it's like we talked about earlier, like them goofing off. You know, like they will for a few minutes slip back into yeah, what they they're, once they're, had. Yeah, but they're fighting off the impending doom of their friendship. Exactly. It's because it's it's dying as 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 well as 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 Nikki dies, it's dying. Um, it's dying. Mikey helps Nikki a lot, and I like Mikey for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you do start to understand why the tagline says "Don't expect to like them" because Nikki incites and Mikey enables um violent, depressive behavior, and and they're being hunted by this man. The man that's hunting them da- down and being one step behind them is representing the impending doom of their friendship and then yeah. Nikki's death, which Nikki is practically running away from. And it also creates a lot of conflict. You know, the technically on paper, the only conflict of this film is, is Nikki going to be killed or mm-hmm. is he going to die from his illness or is, is he going to end up dead? Yeah. But it's the friendship. It's a mini internal conflicts and the dialogues concerning death itself and Nikki's approach to his impending doom. That's the most interesting and emotionally resonant. Um, and then there's that cemetery scene. Oh my god. That scene was so good. I was floored by that. Oh my god. Um... That's I'm like, when I, really I don't got even know the movie. Yeah, that's me when too. I really got into the movie. Yeah. I don't even know like what to say. I one of my favorite yeah. parts was whenever um whenever he goes, um, if anything happens um to me, Mikey did it. And then Mikey gets like really yeah. upset and he's like, No, you, you take, take that, you take that back. back. And then um, they kind of squabble for, like, a few seconds. And then, like, um, and Nikki goes, like, to his mom. His mom's yeah. tombstone. Like, I'm sure you'll find out. Um, and I was like, oh. oh, oh. You can kind of tell. I think from the tone of my voice, it's it's kind of, this whole thing is kind of hard to talk about. Because it is incredibly heartbreaking, mm-hmm. this movie. Um, they jump the fence and Peter Falk is like, listen, I'm not going to stand there at one o'clock in the morning and discuss what's going to happen to me when I die. I mean, that Miss Chagas, I leave to the Catholics. <laughs> Nick, you're making me forget the kiddish. <laughs> <laughs> such a, such a, I love the Jewishness of his character. Um, they're sitting and talking and and Nikki's talking to his mom and, and laughing and suppressing so much emotion. And it's awful, it's heavy and heartbreaking. I teared up. 
and then at the end they have they have an argument and they like kind of laugh it off at that point as well um and they go back on the bus i just think and that's when when peter fox dead brother comes in and you start um, really realizing how close they are mm -hmm. and how much of a bond they've had yeah like nikki knew his deceased brother who died when he was 10 um heartbreaking stuff i mean that just the they know each other in the deepest depths of their soul mm -hmm. and and you can really tell this and and it's very tear-jerking and it's very and that whole cemetery scene where he's talking to his mother and john yeah. cassavetti's performance especially the heart so good and then they go on the bus and they play that little hand slapping game. It's so cute. <laughs> um, um, do you want to talk about that scene? Well, okay. Hold on. I love the fashion in this movie. Just want to put that out there. Mm -hmm. I already talked about the pinky rings, but I like all the fashion. I like uh, the suits and I love the raincoats. Very simple. Also, yeah. The American Friend, directed by Vin Vendors little comparison right here the main character is um i don't know if i can say that actually i don't want to spoil anything um, yeah don't spoil very similar if you guys have seen the american friend um you guys know why i'm making this comparison but yeah american friend let's get to that scene <laughs> 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 man uh, here's what i wrote okay here's my journey with this man nikki's a fucking bad friend the scene with the blonde woman in the house where he neglects nikki i i was still in the middle of this scene during while well, i was writing this the scene in the house where he neglects mickey is especially hard to watch he's also really abusive to her dude he's just full on doing it now with her on the floor and mickey is just left to sit on the fucking trash can and smoke in the kitchen what is this bullshit oh shit now they're taking turns oh shit <laughs> what this is so fuck fucking hate this misogynistic masculine bullshit damn shame that this kind of mentality exists and still exists existed and still exists yeah hate that scene what were you thinking what were you feeling um i was thoroughly disgusted yeah um because let's just start with the fact that um cheaters cheaters cheater cheater pumpkin eaters right um well nikki technically isn't cheating but fuck you well, you know. Yeah, no. But then, well, but then you go back to your, you crawl back to your yeah. wife, so. Yeah, yeah. Pick, pick a struggle, buddy. Pick a struggle. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then, I. Cheater, cheater, I, pumpkin eater. <laughs> I, I was so, I was so disgusted. I was so grossed out. Like, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, like. It, it, like like you're you're gonna have sex with this woman and you're gonna like leave him in the kitchen to just listen to that and and then and then when you're done you're gonna you're gonna go back to the fucking kitchen and then you're gonna be like no like no like she loves you she loves you like like ew it, yeah <laughs> ew ew, ew. <laughs> Ew, and then um, and then and then she's fighting for her life. She's like, "No, I don't want this. I don't want this." Peer, both of them peer pressuring her. He said she succumbed to his yeah. peer pressure, and then she bites him, and then he fucking slaps her. Yeah. And then he slaps her. Yeah. That was a little later, but still, like, yeah, that was like... The, the violence, the 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 violence towards this, towards this poor girl. I was baffled. It is, it is yeah. very gross, and it is an example of um, it's kind of their violent outburst, and they're kind of you know, Nikki is kind of Mikey is taking this as Nikki is humiliating me in front of this girl. Mm -hmm. Um, Nikki is taking it as what does he want? Like, I mean, it's just an object, I'm just like passing it around. Um, and it's kind of just a violent outburst towards each other, really. Yeah, it is. Not expressing their um emotions to each other. So 
And that's how men do it. That's how real men do it. Real men fuck each other. What? What? It, all I'm saying is that all I'm saying is that if those two <laughs> just dished it out once, maybe <laughs> things would have been a lot easier. Guys, I um people calling not Melly specifically, but people at Letterbox calling this gay are oh, really no. Fun, no are not fucking they're misunderstanding the whole thing. Yeah, no. You're not understanding the themes of the film, guys. That's obviously not a funny joke to make right now. Yeah, no, it is not appropriate. Yeah. Like just want to put that out. Like, <laughs> for example, like Dead Poet Society. Yes, you can say that because it's sure, obviously an funny. allegory that's for being funny. gay. No, it's not funny. Yeah. It's an allegory for being There's gay. There's some, yeah. I haven't but seen this. Post, so I, I think. Kept, oh, you. I never found a, alleg- a gay allegory. You've I never seen Dead. I I've seen it. Oh, just like a few, like a bunch of years ago. Okay, well, when you say that this is gay, <laughs> like you're kind of erase. You're no, no, not kind of. You are. You're erasing the extremely complicated. <laughs> story that comes with their relationship um and i don't know yeah. not that i'm trying it's about, to defend... it's about hyper masculine friendship it's, yeah. it's the opposite it's, and, and, it's, and it's how toxic obviously about it is. platonic platonic relations and toxic platonic relations guys no boo don't do that um they go outside the woman's house and they have their big argument and this fucking improvised beautiful brilliant monologue monologue after monologue dialogue um argument with the watch and their fight and they're fighting each other and it's so sad yeah this is masterful stuff peter falk and john cassavetes functioning as master actors masters of their crafts so raw so tragic um when they struggle with one another uh fight have a little brawl there, there. Part, there's one part where Ma- Mikey stands up and he like slips, and you can tell that it's real. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that was that scene amazing. was crazy. Crazy, um, crazy, and heartbreaking. They're finally expressing their emotions, and it was something like not so that I unhealthy and yeah. S- I was going to say just not that I not that I think you should never have to reach this point in a in a relationship where you have to express your feelings yeah. towards one another by fighting in the middle of the dirty street. Yeah. But my goddamn was it so good and so entertaining. <laughs> um um you can definitely tell that there's so much more layers to their like hidden contempt for one another um not only yes. nikki talking shit about mikey and and all the things with the girl as well but also this deep rooted thing to the relationship that like is left unsaid and it's the fact that they're not that they're toxic for one another and they're just very toxic that, that nikki does and things that mikey does that just they don't fit one another and, and this this that this dialogue and this fight and this scene is fucking one of the best acted things i've seen in the wild um so fucking tragic what is there to say tragic not much else um, nikki goes back to his wife his baby refuses to hold his thumb he kind of go topples on his wife and like mm-hmm. his ex and and like kisses her and I guess she's like still so attracted to him but you can tell that she doesn't like love him really she's just like yeah. sexually attracted to him I guess um she doesn't want him to die the guy who's hunting Nikki down is such a goofy goober <laughs> <laughs> it's such a competent um hitman peter fox monologue about his brother to uh, peter fox goes home as well his monologue to about his brother and his dad mm-hmm. that he delivers to his wife is soul shattering and sad um 
it's exhausting. This this whole like second half of the movie is exhausting because like these dialogues are the kind of once in a movie dialogue that you get usually where where it's a breakout of emotion where it's a thing, but this is just an emotional night and it's exhausting. And I was so tired. Um Peter Fox monologue about his brother that died is fucking I said that three times already. And then that ending happens in the morning when the sun comes up. What do you what do you think of the ending? I mean it's obviously really fucking sad. Um because yeah. this this is because we've you've reached a point where Mikey is no longer that's it, he's done. He's cutting Nikki off. Um, he's no longer going to be there for him. He's no longer going to support him. Um, and that obviously comes with first with him knocking on the door. And then he starts saying, like, I need a doctor. I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm dying. And uh, Mikey is still not opening the door. So by that point, it's solidified. And we know that it's done. And, and, and. You you can tell that uh, this is a very hard decision, but it's what had to be done. Sometimes, guys, you have to keep the door locked. Mm -hmm. But then he fucking gets shot. Are. Yeah. He dies. Guys, take the criminal aspect out of this for a second. Sometimes you have to close the door. Mm -hmm. And you got to block it. And and part of and, me is thinking, well, oh, fuck, no, 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 don't, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, um, because I was gonna ask you, like, something about friendship, being friends, it was something along the lines of like, oh, 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 oh. oh. I guess, okay, I think I kind of got it. I guess then this movie kind of, like, poses the question where, like, is it worth it to stay friends even after you know your relationship isn't healthy? Is it worth it to try and salvage possibly what little you have left remaining, right? Or do you end it when you know it's right? Do you end it in a good place? Where, so you have a good ending and, and happy memories to look back on? Or do you prolong the relationship? And, and, and this and, doesn't end in a good place. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I'm not saying that. I mean, like, in, the, no, in their right. past. That's the question. Because um, then I if you... it depends on the relationship. Like, this relationship, I don't know. Maybe This relationship, I think, Mikey made a he made a good decision. decision of sorts but he made he the healthy decision he was ready too to late. kill nikki though he was ready to be in the car like he went in the car and helped the guy hunt nikki down yeah yeah and then when when nikki what when the guy was approaching nikki and they finally found him or they thought they found him there was this guy that was running off and he was like that's him that's him yeah and nikki's like let me out of the car let me out of the car like he can't actually kill him he doesn't like he can't be in the car that runs him over but he can close the door on him mm -hmm. later no yeah he can't and be I the think one in this killing situation him. he made a sort of healthy decision i guess um it's a good question and got me thinking about stuff in my life yeah yeah i know what you're thinking about so it's, it's definitely a gut punch of an mm -hmm. ending the death of a friendship and the death of a man and the um, death of a salesman sorry <laughs> i was just reading that in english like a few months ago oh so. how is it eh, <laughs> it's okay okay <laughs> <laughs> um geez louise yeah any other notes about this shall we get to ratings that's it that's it um you go first no. Yes. You go first. You go first. <laughs> you go first, sir. 
please. Should I do it? Should I go all the way? Oh my god, a five Here's stars? Um, yeah. It's gonna be at a five. Wow. It's, it's, uh, when the emotion is so potent in a film, mm -hmm. um, and it resonates with you on such a visceral level as well, this movie's heartbreaking. Yes, and it that's has, true. It's, it's so simple and it's so emotional. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has so many things that I'm interested in when it comes to filmmaking um i think it's brilliant it's it's hard to talk about as well so thank you for choosing this i'm gonna be out of five wow yep. i was not expecting a five can i say my prediction for yours yes nine out of ten what's a nine out of ten out of a five four and a half. Oh, <laughs> okay close four stars yeah four okay um i really enjoyed it um mm -hmm. i will say the beginning that's the only thing that i was thinking about as well and why it might be a four and a half on that boxed because the yeah. beginning i'm gonna have to rewatch it because in the beginning, I don't know if I was fully settled with the characters because it's that... so because it's kind of like a cold open because it doesn't ease you into their friendship, you know. I'm not asking to be eased. Neither am I. But... I just don't. I just didn't love it. But okay, the second half was really good. Yeah, I Even... think when I give it a five, I'm thinking about the second half. Yeah. <laughs> um. But I'm, oh, you know, yeah, it'll probably be a four and a half on the box. I can get behind a four and a half, maybe better than a five. Gotcha, gotcha. Gonna have to rewatch it, gonna have to experience it for a second time, and it's gonna go up to a five because I just need to rewatch that beginning. Um, it's fantastic. It's, it's amazing. It's emotional. It's Mikey and Nikki. Of course. Overlooked as fuck. Should be. Mm hmm. Should be should be talked I mean, about I know it more. Got talked about more, yeah. Jinx, I know it got talked about more after it's released on Criterion, and and there was this whole thing of it it being an underrated gem from the seventies and all that. Yeah. Um, but even more, guys, to type this up. I think it's brilliant. Um, so I'm glad we did it. Look, I, I'm just looking at the image behind you, and it makes me so sad. This image is beautiful. Yeah. This image is beautiful. Um, anyways, yeah, thank you for choosing this. You're so welcome. Should we get to our pick? Hell yeah. Week? Let's get to next okay. week's pick. I'm Let so excited. The information about it so that I have it in front of me. Um This is the first week. Her. In a really long time where Yoav has not struggled to pick something. I haven't struggled to pick something. And actually, it's because of the date that's coming up. The date. In 10 days, it's 4.20. And in 10 days, it's 4.20. And I wanted to pick something fun to watch. Now. What is what? it? What? Will you off pick? Oh, I know. Yeah. I know what you're. No, picking. no, no. It's not. It's not taking off. It's oh, not taking off. Never mind. It's not taking off. This is a film that neither of us has. If you've seen it, then I'm not doing it. Hold on. Oh God. Let's check if Melly's seen it. I really hope you haven't seen this. Hold on. La, 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 la. Okay, you haven't seen this. This is a okay. film that both of us haven't seen. Okay. And coincidentally, 420 is in 10 days, and this movie came out 10 years ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How... <laughs> okay. It stars a big... We talked about 
this a movie that this guy is in in our film news segment. Oh, well, I will. Is it a stoner movie? Yes. D- don't guess yet. No, no I'm not going to guess, but I do love my stoner movies. Okay. <sighs> Under the paving stones, the beach. In Los Angeles at the turn of the 1970s, drug-fueled detective Larry Doc Spartolello investigates the disappearance of an ex-girlfriend. Directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, it's the film Inherent Vice from 2014. Have you seen this? No, you haven't. Have you seen it? No. Okay, good. Fuck. Shit thick. Oh my god, I'm so excited. (laughs) It stars Joaquin Phoenix, Josh Brolin, Owen Wilson, Catherine uh, Watterson, Reese Witherspoon, Benicio Del Toro, Hong Chow, and Joanna Newsom. Fuck yeah! Fuck yeah! He's really excited. Guys, guys, look, 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 look. Look at what? I'm so excited. Second movie. Guys, guys, also, fun fact, when I was in Boston this past week... On your watch list of all time. Second yeah. ever movie you added yeah. to your watches. When I was in yeah. Boston this past week, my mom and I were looking on the TV channel to try and find something to watch. And mm. um, the, the the channels were not labeled with what the program is, okay? So yeah. click on Showtime and guess what's playing. I see Watson and Josh Brolin... And I was like, oh my god, this is inherent advice. And I immediately turned it off because I was like, I am not about to watch the movie halfway through and get everything spoiled. No, no, no. <laughs> and I'm so excited because Yoav got my brainwaves um, from Boston <laughs> and understood and fucking put that in this shit this week. And I'm so excited because I've been wanting to watch the movie for so long. Thank you. Yes. No problem. I'm very excited to watch this and talk about it. Um, just want. Hopefully, it's going to be a little uplifting. After uh, I think watching so. Mikey and Nikki and Taste of Cherry on the same day, I'm a little sad. I'll tell you that, especially with the per- this period of my life with the tests at school. Fucking watch sucks. Bruno to cheer you up. Should I? Yeah, you I'll should. pop it in. I'll you pop should. it in. Please do. Please do. Okay. I'll let you know what I think. Oh, should I invite a friend? Uh, if you want. Just don't watch okay. with your parents. Okay. Don't I mean, watch I watch Borat with my dad. Yeah, but I think this is... I don't know. <laughs> Up to you. Um, thank you, guys. Watch In Here Advice. Watch Mikey and Nikki. Let us know what you think. Um, And if you haven't seen Mikey and Nikki... Fuck off! <laughs> <laughs> I'll close the door on you. Oh, and uh, me and Maddie have decided not to be friends anymore. So, so yeah, that's that's it, guys. The podcast is over. Let me take off my glasses for a dramatic effect. We're not doing this anymore. Um, just kidding. We're doing this till we die. <laughs> All right, guys. Do you think when we're like fucking like ninety five, we'll? <laughs> Um, episode 1000 of the one on one um <laughs> yes of course <laughs> very funny of course Anyways. we are of course see you guys in the next episode see you guys next week this was fun love you Bye. peace out Bye. suckers